Uh, this morning I've titled this message, Heavenly Father Figures. And um, this, is a, this is a really big deal. I, I get to talk to a lot of Christians uh, from a lot of different denominations, a lot of different backgrounds. Um, people call in with problems. Uh, people see me, people that are struggling with uh, drug abuse or they're struggling with uh, marriage problems or they've got um, problems with their kids relating well to their children. Uh, there's kids who are freaked out by the treatment of their parents. Um, and then on top of that, you've got what I would call maybe uh, religious or spiritual abuse out there. A lot of people have been actually abused spiritually. They were in some church uh, where they weren't loved or cared for. They were just beaten up and they were told to do more and be more and all that stuff. And so it's like uh, whether it's your earthly father or whether it's the local church, or some spiritual figure in your life. I mean, a lot of us kind of grow up with a really messed up view of uh, males and a messed up view of fathers, and then by translation, then a really messed up view of God. And um, so this morning, what I thought would be appropriate on Father's Day is to look at the character of our Heavenly Father and sort of work backwards. It's, it's, we've been working in the wrong direction. We've been um, looking at people on planet Earth as pictures and shadows and figures of our Heavenly Father, and that's all messed up. I mean, that's messed up. There's nobody on planet Earth that is like Him. Uh, there's nobody who is a really good picture or shadow or symbol of Him uh, except Jesus. And um, so let's take, a, let's take a little glimpse at our Heavenly Father today on Father's Day. Amen? Amen. So father figures. Uh, you know, some of us uh, have had um, abusive fathers. I've met uh, lots of people who um, have experienced sexual abuse. Um, they've experienced emotional abuse. You know, the thing where you were never good enough and um, your dad just sort of either beat you up physically or uh, he beat you up emotionally. Um, you, you could never... Uh, do enough to please him. He never, maybe for some people, they never heard, I'm proud of you. Uh, they never heard, I love you. You know, there's some adult people running around planet Earth who, you know, they never heard their father say, I love you. Sometimes males are not real good at expressing love, right? We're not real good at expressing approval, love, affirmation. Um, it, it's like we're, we, we can get into task mode. You know, we're going to get a task done. Can you imagine sitting on your deathbed and just going, wow, look at all the tasks I got done. You know, I'm really impressed with all the tasks I accomplished. Uh, I, I don't think that's what our, our deep heartfelt wish is, uh, men, as, as fathers, as men. I, I think um, whether we're male or female, we're going to want to look back and, and see that uh, we enjoyed relationships and that we shared in the love of God and that we were able to love other people and um, really enjoy people, including and especially our children. Um, but, uh, you know, the biggest temptation, I, mean, I don't know if it's in this world or if it's in this country especially or if it's just being male uh, or whatever it is, but the task-oriented life, um, we got to watch out for that. There's lots of stuff that needs to get done and it needs to get done fast sometimes. But we can't, we can't afford to miss the relationships in the process. And so we've had, you know, some people have had abusive fathers. They've had what you could call absentee fathers. You know, an absentee father is someone who's literally physically absent, or they were there, but they weren't there. You know what I mean? Anybody uh, ever known someone or anybody had a father who was there, but they're not really there? I mean, they're glued to the TV with the remote in their hand or, or whatever it might be, and sort of the kid comes passing through the room. And so the father is sort of a, a distant supplier. He's given you a roof, and you're grateful for that. He's given you walls and a place to sleep and food on the table, and that's awesome. It's better than starving. <laughs> it's better than having no place to lay your head. But there's an absentee father, even if he's around. Um, 
you know, my father passed away. Many people in this room have lost their father. So uh, whether they're good or bad or uh, average, I mean, we, we can lose people. And that world comes shattering down. And so then you think, well, gosh, I'm a human. I'm, I'm meant to function as a, as a child who has a father, so what now? And I think that's where really the, the emphasis on God being our father becomes an even bigger deal. Um, so, so let's look at a few passages here. I mean, the first thing we learn about our father is that he, um, he, he's soft-hearted and he's a rescuer. Uh, look at this passage in Matthew 18. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, uh, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. So what I love about this is, I mean, we've been asking questions like, um, I don't know, I mean, maybe did I commit the unpardonable sin? Did I sin too much? Is, is God, you know, hacked off at me uh, because I, I'm not performing as well as the other guy? Um, you know, what we see here basically is not a God who's angry with you, not a God who's frustrated because you ran off. I mean, we're all sheep. You know, sheep are some of the dumbest animals on the planet, right? You've heard that, uh, that, you know, and then I don't think it's no, any coincidence that God uh, refers to us as sheep sometimes because we can do some pretty dumb stuff. And we wander off. I got an email uh, this morning from a guy a long way away from here. Nobody knows. But he's, he's asking me. I mean, he did something. And he's really ashamed. Um, and he's never done anything like this before. He's never done anything this big. And it's wrecked his thought life and his emotion, emotions. He, he doesn't, he's trying to get his bearings. What does God think of me now? How much has actually changed? I believe in this total forgiveness stuff, but man, when something actually really happens where I've committed something that I believe is heinous, I mean, does God really not change toward me? I mean, does he really stick with me? And what this is saying is that he not only uh, sticks with you, uh, he chases after you. He pursues you. Um, you may be stuck in all kinds of stuff. People talk about, uh, you know, it seems like a lot, of, a lot of theology is sin-centered. We've got some sin-centered theology instead of Jesus-centered theology. So the sin-centered theology basically goes like this. Um, you know, when you sin, you're off on your own. I mean, if you choose to sin, well, you've gone off the reservation, and so you're off on your own, and um, you're what's called out of fellowship, perhaps. You know, that's a very... Um, uh, uh, it's a popular term in certain denominations that when you sin, you fall out of fellowship. So uh, basically God said, yeah, uh, you, you blew it, so go over there and do your thing, and when you're done and you've fixed it up and you've changed your mind, come on back and I'll be over here. See, there's geographic distance there. The Father has separated himself. You go do that and I'll be here when you get back. But this, this verse, this passage doesn't give us that image, does it? This passage is, hey, what's going on? Let me, let me be with you. I'm, I'm sticking this out with you. I'm coming to look for you, so to speak. Uh, I'm not uh, going to be absentee or performance-based. I'm not going to be over here until you shape up. Uh, if, if you're going to engage in this stuff, you've got to engage in this stuff with a loving father who's right there with you chasing after you, pursuing you, wanting something better for you, not abandoning you. Um, and I want you to notice, too, the individual value that he puts on you. What does it say? He's got 99 more, right? He's got 99 more. He's got the missionary in Africa. The missionary in Africa is back safe at home somewhere, okay? He's got Billy Graham back over there. He's got all your favorite saints out there. They're all safe and secure back in the fold, but he, he's interested in you. And so what I love about this is God is big, but God is small. God is small in that he is in your world, and he cares about you individually. A lot of us have a generic theology. We have a generic belief system about our Father. 
Oh yeah, God loves the world. Sounds wonderful, John 3, 16. So what? That means nothing for you if God just loves the world. At some point, it's got to be up close and personal. It's got to be in your face. So what I love about this is the individual love of God, that God has time for you. And that by placing the spirit of Jesus Christ inside of you, he's saying, I don't want to just love the world. I want to spend time with you. We spell love time spent. It's really hard. You know, I've got a son, Gavin. If I just tell him, I love you, Gavin. I love you, Gavin. I love you, Gavin. And every, every day or every week, I tell him I love him. But I don't spend any time with him. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure he's going to believe me. I mean, love is, is time spent. So by depositing his spirit within you, he's saying, I want to be with you 24-7 without interruption, no matter what. And that's time spent. And that's how God spells love. And it's individual. So watch out for, for the global theology. Sure, God loves the world. But that's not going to do you much good. God loves and cares deeply for you individually. So he values you. Your heavenly father values you. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? You know what this is saying to me? Um, there's a deep concern. God has a deep concern for you. And uh, this is a really hard one to swallow uh, for me at times. I mean, emotionally, I, I, I get the answer, no, 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 no. He doesn't care. Um, but, but really, the reality is, is that he has a deep concern for your problems. Um, you know, that's, that's incredible. It doesn't mean that everything gets fixed and everything gets fixed quick. But just the heart of the Father, that he cares for you and that he cares for the stuff you're going through. And that doesn't mean that he halts planet Earth. Um, you know, I mean, planet Earth is coming at us and our Heavenly Father is working in us. He's called the God of all comfort. So it's not that he halts planet Earth. It's not that he shuts down the effects of the fall. You know, in the garden when the fall of man happened and all of the chaos and the sin and the death and the disease, it doesn't mean that he just halts everything. Uh, the, the results of the fall still stand for a while. Um, but he cares deeply for you and your problems. And he's known as the God of all comfort. So, you know, those trust falls, you guys ever been to a camp or you've been to like a business, uh, you know, retreat or something. And they, they tell you basically, you know, stand up on a chair like this and then, uh, you know, just fall off the chair into somebody's arms. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody done this? Yeah. Pretty scary. Depends on who's catching you, right? I mean, it depends if I've if I've got to Gavin down here. Yeah. And I'm up here, and I'm falling. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not so sure. Uh, I mean, not, not because of his intent. He might want to catch Daddy. But, you know, he's just not ready yet. You know, we're talking about issues of strength. We're talking about issues of ability, uh, stability. Uh, someone who's anchored to the ground pretty strong and can, can take your weight. So I wonder if... Uh, you know, looking at a verse like this, I wonder if you're making that trust fall into the arms of your father, if you believe he'd catch you. What he's saying is, I'll catch you. I'll catch you every single time. I'm stable. I'm secure. I'm anchored. I'll catch you. You're going through crud right now, but I'm going to catch you. So he made you his. Here we see in uh, Romans 8, you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. You know, this is one of the huge things. I mean, looking at Christians and what we heard about and what we struggle with, fear. Uh, fear of God. Some people, there's a video out there right now, a popular teacher put it out a few years ago. I mean, there's a room and there's this lady in bed and she's just laying there in bed and the room starts to fill with water. Like the room gets uh, a foot deep in water and then three feet and then six feet and she's going like this, just gasping for air, laying on the bed. And eventually it gets up over her and she's drowning and her arms are flailing and all that. And in the background, the narrator's saying, this is the sort of fear 
of God that we need to have. Yeah. I mean, really popular video, loads of watches on YouTube and stuff. And so you talk about a horror-filled image of your Heavenly Father. We're mixing reverence and awe and respect and woe, you are Lord and you are God with absolute terror and fright. No wonder, you know, if that's mainstream stuff, I mean, no, matter, no wonder Christians are, we're pretty messed up sometimes about what our Heavenly Father looks like. I mean, in some cases, some of the stuff I hear about uh, what people believe about their Heavenly Father, I mean, if you had a father like that, we'd be calling CPS, you know? We'd be calling Child Protective Services to come rescue you from someone like that. Uh, and so we've got some things messed up, but Romans 8 says, you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I shared the meaning of Abba, didn't I? A few weeks ago, that you go to Israel, you walk down the street, you can, uh, you can hear little kiddos, and they're, you know, grabbing the tunic of the guy in front of them saying, Abba, Abba, it's basically dad or daddy. And so what this is saying is that your heavenly father has given you the right, the privilege, the honor of total access, total closeness, and that you get to call him daddy. And so then we... You know, we get into our prayer language. No, I'm not talking about tongues, okay? But we get into our prayer language, you know, where we bring out the... I mean, we basically bring out the King James when it's time to talk to God. I mean, 1611 or you ain't going to heaven, right? But we, we talk normal, you know, to Joe and Jim and John. And then when it gets to God, we go, Thou, Lord, oh, thou art... You know, I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Are you Shakespeare? <laughs> um, it, it's, it's time for us to see uh, the access we have and the closeness we have and that we don't have to put on church talk when we talk to dad. We've been given the right, the privilege, the honor to call him daddy father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're, children, that we're God's children. People talk about um, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Um, if you grew up like I did um, in, in the United States on planet Earth, uh, the moment you hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit, what do you think of? Oh, he's beating me up again about all the sins I've done. The conviction of sin. But you know what the Bible actually says? The Bible actually says that when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will convict the world concerning sin. And it says he will convict the world concerning sin because they do not believe in me. And then it goes on to say that he will convict of, of righteousness. And I wonder if you've ever thought about the Holy Spirit convicting you of your righteousness. You know, when you convict someone of something, I mean, you're basically convincing them, similar root. I mean, you're uh, laying out the case Right? If I tried to convince you uh, of the existence of George Washington, well, I would bring out all kinds of evidence and I would uh, give history lessons and I would present documents. And, and basically, the Holy Spirit, one of his main roles is to convince you of your righteousness and convince you of your sonship, convince you that you're God's kid. So, you know, the, the, it's interesting because we've got these wings of Christianity. We've got, um, you know, the charismatic and Pentecostal wing over here, and then we'll call it, you know, I don't know, the, the Baptist and other Protestant kind of wing over here. And so over here, uh, the Holy Spirit is portrayed to you as consisting of certain things. I mean, if this is not going on in your life, and this is not going on in your life, and this is not going on in your life, then what in the world? You, you're probably not even saved, Okay. I mean, if you're not healing people and speaking in tongues and raising some people from the dead, you know, I, I, I want to invite all, I mean, if this is like a regular everyday thing for these folks, I, I want to invite them up to the local hospital. Just please go down the halls, right? And just heal people immediately. But God heals and there are miracles. But I mean, this crowd would tell us that if these things aren't happening, then you're not experiencing the Holy Spirit. 
Now this crowd over here, maybe some of what they've painted in terms of the picture of the Holy Spirit is the, is the Holy Spirit is the police. I mean, the Holy Spirit is here to tell you all the bad things you've done all the time, and he's going to be your conscience and your police. He's your sin police. Okay, so, so then here you are, caught in the middle, and you're examining both movements. Uh, well, uh, hmm, that's not going on for me. I guess that, that's not for me, or I'm not good enough, or I'm not qualified, or I'm not really saved, or I'm not, I'm not. And then you look over here, and you examine this movement, and you say, well, yeah, I mean, I'll sign up for that if I have to, but it sounds like I'm pretty much going to wake up and feel like dirt. So is it chase experiences or feel like dirt? You see that when it comes to the Holy Spirit? Chase experiences or feel like dirt? And what God is telling us is, no, 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 no. no. There's a third way and there's a third view. And here it is. I poured out my Holy Spirit into your heart to convince you that my son did what my son did and it worked. And you're a forgiven person and I'm going to convince you of your righteousness and I'm going to convince you of your sonship. And that is my primary role. I may go out into the frontiers of mission work and I may give people special ability to share the gospel and I may heal somebody like Chuck Martin laying in a hospital bed and I may do miracles and I may do wonders and I may do this and I may do that and there's a diversity of things that I may do that I may do because I, God, call the shots. But I'll tell you that the consistent day in, day out role that I will play in your life as the Holy Spirit, is I'll convince you of your righteousness and I will convince you that you're my kid. He's a giver. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? That'd be a dirty trick. Imagine I send Gavin off, he opens his lunchbox at noon and it's a stone sandwich. Maybe just once, just to get a reaction. I'll be there with my GoPro, just sort of. Or if he asks for a fish, is that wrong? Uh, if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So you, you look at these contrasts. You ask for a fish, is he going to give you a snake? Now that is some nasty, nasty dinner food, right? I mean, the contrast is wild here. I ask for a fish, and you're going to give me a snake. So it's black and white. That's the point. It's good or evil. It's black and white. So God is a giver of good gifts. But it's like uh, we're, we're doing the Christian karma thing. You know, when you play the Christian karma game, you sort of survey your circumstances. This is what I catch myself doing. Talk to people that do this. It seems like it's a human thing. We'll survey our circumstances, and we'll say, okay... Well, let me think about this. I've lost my job. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, half of the income I used to have with this new job. Uh, my husband or wife left me recently. Um, someone in my life, a relative, just passed away. So, um, God, why'd you do this? Why'd you do this? And see, we're going we're gonna to take all our circumstances and we're just going to take the... It's like we went to Staples, you know, the office store. We went to Staples and we got the labels. And we picked out the, the blue ones that said God on it. And then we went in all our circumstances. We slapped a sticker. God, 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 God. We're labeling everything that's happening to us. And then we, we decide, God, who are you and why are you doing this? <laughs> and uh, the answer is he's not. I mean, it's okay to not attribute everything to God. It really is okay to not attribute everything to God. I know what we've heard. We've heard that sovereignty, some of us have heard that sovereignty means that God does everything. You take that to an extreme, and God does everything good or bad, and then you try to factor in rape and murder, and what, what are we thinking? God doesn't do everything. There are other players in the theater of life. The world, the flesh, the devil, the drunk driver, right? Don't play the Christian karma game and don't try to put a God stamp on everything and then figure out what your father looks like. Good luck with that. We have to put blame where blame is deserved. 
So, Father, is a, he's a giver of good gifts. We don't have to fear him. Perfect love casts out fear. Other things we see about this God the giver is, well, you know, I'm a little bit scared of God still, though, because I've heard that, I've heard that if I surrender, have you heard that term? It's not in the Bible, but we use it. It's all right. It's all right. I'm not sure about it. I'm still thinking. The, the jury's out for me. But uh, if you surrender to him, I mean, he'll probably send you out on the mission field to uh, Bangladesh or something. I mean, you'll probably be gone about 25 years, then you can come back and raise a family, okay? As a senior citizen, you start, start bearing children, and you, know, you can have a normal life after you've earned it on the mission field or something, right? I mean, some of us have heard these sort of things, not, not spoken directly. Nobody's going to say that to you. But the implication is, is that there's regular Christians and then there's the people who are in full-time work and serious service, right? And that if you were really committed and really surrendered, you'd get up into tier two. Um, and that's not a family. There aren't, tier, there aren't tiers in a family. See, we're talking about father-son, father-child relationship here. We're in a family. There aren't tears. Um, so you see what kind of giver God is there? See, if you surrender to him, then God's going to give you something you don't really want. But the Bible says that God causes you to want of his good pleasure. So do you get that whatever God gives to you, you're actually going to want because he's the giver of good gifts. And I'm not saying that it's all smooth and cushy, right? But I'm saying that deep down we're going to want it because it, he's working the want in us. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get to here is this idea of surrender, first of all. We surrender typically, who do we surrender to? When you think of the word surrender out in the world, who do you surrender to? An enemy. We typically wave the white flag. We come out and we say, I'm done fighting you. You win. You defeat me. Now you can imprison me or take over my land. Right? An enemy. So, you know, I'm not here to criticize the word surrender. Lots of good teachers that I respect still use that word. But think about it. We surrender typically to an enemy. Is that really the right word? We're told that we offer ourselves to God. We're told that we offer our bodies as a living, not dead, a living sacrifice. God's not trying to kill us. We're, we were already crucified with Christ. So he's building us up. We offer ourselves to Dad, and he loves us and invests in us and cares for us, and he's not our enemy. God's given me a burden that I just can't handle. God's given me too much. Will God give you more than, you know, we, we worry about this word burden. And people talk about what God's put on us. And, we're, and a lot of times it's just legalistic junk. It's not our father. Use it or lose it. You heard that? If you've got a spiritual gift, you better use it or lose it. <laughs> so God's going to give you this wonderful uh, outreach and ministry to encourage people, be hospitable to people, love people, care for them, Christ in you. But if you don't hurry up and use it, <laughs> we hear this stuff. He loves you deeply. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Remember, we covered this passage in, in, in its entirety not too long ago. It's like John stops and he goes, whoa, and that is what we are. Wow, how great this love is. So I want to uh, finish with this passage here. Um, you know, it's like we're trying, to, we're trying to get a handle on what the, the, the Father looks like. I mean, aren't we? I mean, there's religions around the world and they're looking up at the sky and they're wailing at a wall or they're dancing around a campfire or they're trying to say the right prayers and move the right beads across the string and do this and do that. We're trying to just somehow 
I want to get in God's good graces. I want to know God. I want to feel God. I want to see what God looks like. And, and Jesus really gives us the answer to this. And it's real simple, but we spend a lifetime probing the depths of it. And here it is. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And that'll be enough. That's all I ask. Just show us the Father. Would you just open like a, a window, if you could just use your powers and just split open the atoms in this universe and just allow the Father to come through and just show us one time. Okay, that's all I'm asking. I'm not asking for the moon here. I just want you to give us a window into the Father one time. And Jesus says, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me? Um, it's interesting, I travel around and I speak some places and uh, one of the things, I would say the most popular thing that I ever hear I would say I've heard it probably 250, 300 times so far. Different places. I hear the same thing. This is basically it. Um, I feel like I've known this message of God's grace and love and forgiveness all my life. Or I feel like I've known this ever since I was a Christian. I've known this in my heart. But you are simply just putting words on what I already believed or knew deep down. Have you ever felt that way? It's because we got, yeah, we got the renewing of the mind, but the word's been implanted in our hearts. People say, I've got it all up here, but I need to get it down here, and that's dead wrong. No, no, that means you're a know-it-all. You're a know-it-all. <laughs> we can all just go home and no more, no more learning, no more growing, no more renewing of the mind. I've got it all up here. I just need to get it down here. And it, God's saying the polar opposite. I've implanted it here. And now you're going to experience the renewing of the mind up here. So what people are saying is my brain is catching up to what God has put here already. And Jesus is saying, have I been with you so long? <laughs> you want to know the Father? Doesn't your gut, doesn't your spiritual gut tell you what the Father's like? Doesn't your spiritual gut tell you how good he is? And so we get our heads full of information and junk, and then we get confused. But our spiritual gut, where Christ lives, he says, have I been so long with you? Haven't I been here all along? Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? It's like we've got soft, loving, kind, sacrificial Jesus and then harsh, cold, judgmental Father. And what he's saying is, I and the Father are one. Hmm. How good is your Father? Is he as good as your Jesus? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works. Hey, just believe, would you? Uh, doesn't matter to me why. You just hop on board. Truly, truly, I say to you, we'll finish with this. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. And immediately we start thinking, uh, let's see, what? How many, how many people have I raised from the dead? Uh... uh Zero? Is it? But he, but, but he said, and, and so we, we, see, what we want is fireworks. And Paul said, I show you a greater way, a better way, and what is it? An incredible love. I, I mean, if we've got Christ living in us, weird, weird stuff happens. You start loving people you're not supposed to love. Uh, even when you um, want to, you feel like you want to get angry and blow up and be a jerk, uh, there's something deeper within you. Uh, don't go that route. You can, but don't go that route. You're going to love this. Love this guy anyway and watch what God does with it. Um, I could tell you a story, but, well, all right. <laughs> we, had a, we had a guy, I never met him before. I had him come out and do some work at the house. Uh, we're moving uh about six miles away. So we've got a lot of work to do. Well, this guy, you know, I'd heard good things, and so he came out to do some painting and stuff, and um, uh, 
you know, I found out later he'd never used the sprayer before. Uh, but uh, so I thought maybe he was going to roll it or spray it if he was an you know, expert sprayer. Turns out uh, he decided that my house would be his first test case of using his sprayer that he had bought yesterday. Uh, so he, um, he, he, you know, he, he didn't put down any, any drop cloths or, or anything on the walls or the windows. So he sprayed, his job was to spray the ceiling, right? You spray the ceiling. So he's upside down spraying. And when he's done, I mean, the ceiling looks, well, eh, eh, it looks all right. But uh, then you look down, and he's also painted the floor. And then he's, uh, he's painted the, uh, the windows. So they got, you can take your fingernail and go up to the windows, and there's little white specks everywhere. And he also painted the fireplace. Uh, so, so then it was 30 hours of cleanup after that. Uh, but it was really weird. And, and I mean, you can you can look at my archives of sermons. Uh, I don't I don't tell personal stories very often about me, but it just fits. Um, it was really weird. I mean, my gut reaction was, "What have you done? Uh, I can't believe this. I'm angry. I'm frustrated." Uh, but something else took over. Um, I, uh, I I I. Uh, you know, I just, I hugged the guy, I thanked the guy for his work, we cleaned up together, um, we became friends, uh, we're getting together for coffee, uh, we talked about spiritual matters over the five or six days there, weird stuff, I mean, um, God stuff, I, if you know me, you probably know that be, being a jerk sometimes can come natural to me. Uh, so I'm just telling you that, like, I mean, sometimes you just find yourself through, through the love of God doing things you don't anticipate doing and having reactions that you don't anticipate having. Uh, and, you know, that's these, these greater works. I, I don't think we're healing people and pulling people out of wheelchairs all the time. But there's a power in God's love. Um, and it does change the way that we respond. We grow in the love of God and in the knowledge of, of, of how forgiving and soft and loving Jesus really is. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Lord, let's pray together for a Lamborghini for me. Would... Uh, apparently, that's not what he means, right? Uh, so apparently, though, there is an asking in his name where his heart is represented, right? So if we ask and his heart is represented, his name is represented in the asking, apparently he's interested in doing that anyway because it's on his heart. Um, I'll finish with this. Uh, um, you know, you go over to, the, to a foreign country and you're told to represent the president, but while you're going over there, you just decide, well, you know, I've kind of been thinking about our country and stuff that I think would go well for our country. So you start scribbling out your own agenda and you present that at the meeting. Well, you're, not, you're no longer speaking in the name of the president. You're speaking in your name. It's not his heart you're representing. It's your heart. So... That's sort of a picture. Um, we're not told that we can ask for Lamborghinis and mansions and all of a sudden, poof, they appear. But what is on the good heart of the Father? He is a giver of good things. What is it that he's promised you? He's promised you growth. He's promised you understanding. Uh, he's promised you his love. He's promised you his wisdom. He's promised you his comfort. And if we're praying along those lines, guess what? He promises, he promises that he'll come through. Let's pray together. Father, we're impressed. Uh, we're just really impressed with um, this kind of love that you have for us. Um, it's weird. Uh, it's different. Um, we don't have a really good example of it among our peers. And so here we are just uh, trying to learn how great you are. We thank you for your son and that you've given us a picture-perfect representation of him, a picture-perfect representation of yourself within him. If we want to get to know you, Father, we're going to do what you said. We're going to look right at Jesus. We're going to look right at Jesus to see you. In his name we pray, amen.
sing to the cross, to the cross I will. To the cross I cling. From its suffering I do drink. From its work I do sing. For only my Savior will. Bruised and crushed, show that God is love and God is just. The cross you beckon me, don't be gently. Fathers to remain standing for just a minute. Where are we got kids that are coming around. If you're not a father, take a seat for just a minute. We got the kids passing through the auditorium now. Uh, they're going to give you a little gift, just a way of saying Happy Father's Day. So kids, come on in, run around, look for any person standing up. You know, if you're hungry, I guess you could stand too, but that seems rude. <laughs> Uh, but it's just our, our way of uh, saying Happy Father's Day here at Church Without Religion. We're grateful for the way that you've looked to your Heavenly Father in dependency to father your children, mentor them, shape them, mold them. Wow. Imagine flying solo. Imagine flying solo without a heavenly role model, someone who you look to. We're lucky, we're blessed, we're really fortunate to be fathered, looking to a father who can be father in and through us. Keep on standing, fathers, don't give up. If you don't have any candy yet, stay standing. Kids, if you've got candy, come give it to the people standing. I think uh, I think we did it. We either did it or you gave up. But let's. Now, if you, oh, thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for worshiping with us today and celebrating the beauty of this incredible love that we have from our Heavenly Father. Have a great day.